Andrea di Pietra dalla Gondola, called Palladio, was the most imitated architect of all time. Palladio's influence spread through Europe and via Georgian England to the great southern plantations of America. In the 19th century, it extended westward to affect such buildings as the courthouse in Galveston, Texas. In recent times, even the common gas station has been clothed in Palladian splendor. Palladio is admired today for his skillful accommodation of buildings to their sites, urban and natural, and for his inventive interpretation of the classical tradition. Classical tradition is a strict system of structure and decoration using copies of ancient Roman columns, entablatures, pediments, and carvings to embellish plain walls and simple openings. The classical tradition is also an emphasis on simple, clear geometric forms composed with symmetry and balance. In Palladio's work, it's refinement of proportions, a fixing of precise ratios of length to width to depth and height that give one a sense of equilibrium in and around his buildings. Palladio's knowledge of ancient architecture was extraordinary, even in the Renaissance, which was an age steeped in antiquity. He was one of the founders of archaeology. He drew the illustration for the 1567 edition of the work of architecture by the Roman writer Vitruvius. He wrote a guide to the antiquities of Rome, and at the age of 62, in 1570, he published his famous Four Books of Architecture, in which he combined his knowledge of ancient buildings with a presentation of his own work. It's lavishly illustrated with woodcuts. These images, rather than his buildings themselves, influenced the architects of later generations. The book has sections on palaces, temples and churches and villas will follow the same scheme in looking at his work. Most of Palladio's palaces and urban buildings are found in Vicenza, his churches in the city of Venice, and his many villas in the countryside of the Veneto. Palladio was born in 1508 in Padua, the mainland town nearest to Venice. As a boy, he was apprenticed to a stone cutter. In 1524, he broke his contract and fled to nearby Vicenza. When Palladio arrived, Vicenza was still a medieval town of narrow streets lined with arcades. Renaissance taste was found only in details like this church portal of 1531 carved by the stone-cutting shop that Palladio had joined. The one Renaissance building was the villa of John Giorgio Trisino, Vicenza's leading author and scholar. Trisino recognized Palladio's talents, gave him an education, and took him to Rome. 
There he saw ancient architecture for the first time. Palladio the architect was the creation of the nobles of Vicenza. Vicenza had been conquered by Venice in the 15th century, but was kindly treated. Its wealthy feudal aristocrats were allowed to keep their lands and even some of their power. The aristocrats needed an architect to help plan a grand piazza, bordered by civic buildings, and then to embellish the town with palaces for themselves and a permanent theater. Though most of the nobles were career soldiers who often fought among themselves, they collaborated in expressing their civic pride. In the center of town was a large Gothic hall like the one in Padua. In Vicenza, the outer arcade had fallen in long before Palladio's time. The building needed complete restoration. The nobles invited the greatest architects in North Italy to advise on the design, and in 1549 gave the job to Palladio. The building was renamed the Basilica, after the civic halls and the ancient Roman forums. Palladio had to accommodate to the old walls and the low vaulted ceilings of the earlier building. He simply added an outer arcade. In each bay, which is the space between two of the tall columns, he put an arch on small columns, flanked by rectangular openings. This allowed him to span the broad bays without having to raise the arches higher than the old vaults. This device also reconciled the arcade to the varying bay widths of the old structure. All the arches are more or less the same height but the rectangular sections alongside could be expanded and contracted to adjust to the irregularities. Palladio probably adapted the three-part arch from the upper story of the library on the Piazzetta of San Marco in Venice, which was being built by Jacopo Sansovino. Palladio called it perhaps the most elegant building made since antiquity. The Vicenza Piazza followed the Piazzetta in Venice in its shape and scale. Except on festival occasions, only the nobility was allowed in the Piazza. Common people gathered in the smaller market square on the opposite side, or in the shops under the arcades, which still survive. Once the basilica was under construction, the great families began to build palaces, as if they'd agreed not to serve their private interests until public needs had been met. The palaces on the narrow streets in the center of town were deep row houses. Their short facades were meant to impress pedestrians. Approaching the Valmorana Palace of the mid-1560s, you pass small-scale adjacent buildings. The end bays differ from all the others. On the second level, where the family lives, there's a statue of Minerva in armor. The windows in these bays are smaller than the others. This gives the passerby a gentle transition from the modest neighbors to the grandiose scale of the palace. The owner was portrayed with his family by a local artist.
Sculpture advertises the Valmarana tradition of military service. This panel associates them with the valor of Hercules. Many other nobles employed Palladio to design their palaces, and every design was different, specific to the owner and to the site. The Chiaricati Palace was started a year after the Basilica by a member of the Basilica Building Committee. Its facade is on the long side of the palace and has porticos opening onto the public piazza in front of it, called the Isola. Across the Isola was the river port, and the open space served as a cargo deposit. When this view was drawn in 1580, construction of the palace had halted with only one end complete. The portico is referred to by the owner in a petition of March 1551 for an easement of the right of way, which reads, I, Girolamo Chiaricati, have been advised by expert architects and by many honorable citizens that a portico should be made along the facade of this house for my greater convenience and for the ornament of the whole city. This being not only for the benefit of the public and of no harm or offense to anyone, but rather convenient and useful to the neighbors. Because it fronted an open space, the Chiaricati Palace could follow the scheme Palladio favored in his villas, an accented central block flanked by two slightly recessed wings. The palace was completed only a century later. An economic depression kept all of Palladio's patrons from finishing the grand mansions they had planned. Vicenza's ruling class wanted a cultural renaissance as well as urban renewal. In 1535, the Olympic Academy was founded to promote the arts and the sciences. Palladio, the only artist member, designed a Roman theater for the Academy in 1579. A 1580 document states that each academician should have his own statue made in stucco at his own expense with his name and motto and coat of arms. The theater was intended to encourage the revival of classical drama. It opened in 1585 with a new translation of Oedipus Rex, which is being performed here by a student company. Music for the choruses was composed by Andrea Gabrielli, organist of San Marco in Venice. Palladio was in his mid-fifties when he first worked in Venice. He must have dreamed for decades of the opportunities offered by the natural setting of this city in the water, where, he wrote, all the good arts flourish. Venice only remains as an example of the grandeur and magnificence of the Romans.
State commissions for the imposing Renaissance buildings, like those on the Venice Piazza, had been captured by Jacopo Sansovino and others, a generation older than Palladio. Palladio finally got his chance with church commissions. He set out to design innovative interior spaces and exteriors that joined, in an unprecedented way, the features of ancient temples to traditional Christian church facades. In 1562, Palladio was commissioned to design the facade of San Francesco della Vigna, though Sansovino, the architect of the church, had expected to get the job. Palladio's decision to use the elements of Roman temple fronts caused complex problems. Ancient temples hugged the ground, emphasizing the horizontal. Medieval and Renaissance churches had high central naves and lower side aisles. But Roman columns had fixed proportions and could not be stretched to any desired height. At San Francesco, a podium was simulated to raise the columns high enough to reach the roof. This left the frame of the door suspended in midair. San Giorgio Maggiore was designed three years later in 1565 for a Benedictine monastery on the island facing Piazza San Marco. Here, the central columns are on high pedestals, while those on the side rise from ground level. This makes it seem that a tall, narrow temple is superimposed on a low, broad one. The facade was completed from Palladio's model long after his death. The round window he had placed over the door was covered over, and other major changes may have been made. The islands of the Venetian lagoon provided spectacular sites for churches. They tempted architects to think of facades as theatrical scenery. Here is San Michele in Isola, built a century before San Giorgio. Its white stone facade is entirely distinct from the plain sides. Palladio San Giorgio follows this tradition. While the facade is a public show demanding attention, the body of the church reveals a monastic scorn of finery. At the Church of the Redentore, Palladio raised the base of the facade on a true Roman podium and lowered the top of the pediment to the eave of the roof rather than to the peak. The real roof then repeats the pediment triangle exactly. Most important, the dome can be seen, which rarely happens in Renaissance churches. Though the design makes the pediment a false sign of what happens behind, the parts now fit perfectly. Palladio's successive experiments resolved the paradox of the temple front. The body of the church, however, is again extremely simple, as we see from its monastery garden. The church itself has always been tended by Capuchin monks, but it was built for the Senate of the Venetian Republic. In Venice, the state assumed most of the Pope's power over religious affairs. The senators vowed to build this church if the city survived the terrible plague of 1575. They even debated what form it should take. Palladio's supporters wanted it to be circular, but the majority favored the rectangular plan that eventually was built as we see here. The full Senate, as part of its vow, was obliged to go in procession through the city to attend an annual mass in the church. A pontoon bridge had to be built across the wide Judeca Canal for the last stage of the procession. 
This engraving shows the evening festivities accompanying the event in the 18th century. The tradition survives to the present day. The bridge remains for only 24 hours. The church has three parts corresponding to its three functions. The nave on the right for the lay congregation, a screened-off choir in the rear for the Capuchin monks who tended the church, and under the dome, the tribune, a spacious area to accommodate the senators on the day of their visit. There is almost no surface decoration. To give unity, a gray marble frieze ties together the nave and the tribune. Palladio followed the suggestion he'd made in the four books. Of all the colors, none is more suitable to temples than white, inasmuch as purity in color, as well as in life, is supremely gratifying to God. He wanted to suggest the presence of God not in pictures, but through the abstract perfection of his spaces and the richness of his modeled light. During the Middle Ages, the Venetian state had been confined to islands like Torcello, which we see here, in a protected lagoon at the head of the Adriatic Sea. Her wealth had been based on shipping. In the 14th and 15th centuries, Venice responded to the competition of other nations on the seas by invading North Italy, reaching almost to Milan on the west and to present-day Yugoslavia on the east. As Venice lost her preeminence in trade with the east, her wealthy families turned to agriculture as a source of income. Vast reclamation schemes were required to turn the swampy shores and river valleys into arable land. At first, the farm centers were simple gatherings of utility buildings. Occasionally, there was also a modest dwelling suitable for short visits by the owner. Architects were not needed. Later, more elegant villas were built behind high walls like medieval castles with drawbridges and towers. The villa at Roncade was designed in the year of Palladio's birth, 1508. The farm structures were placed along the surrounding walls, leaving the residents isolated in the center. Most of Palladio's villas are clustered around Vicenza and Padua. The northernmost is at Mazer, in the foothills of the Alps. As agriculture became a major investment for the great landowners, they began to live on their estates for at least part of the year to supervise the work. They wanted a new kind of villa, imposing an urbane elegance on efficient farm buildings. At each end of the Barbaro Villa is a dovecot for raising fowl, an important food in winter when hunting was restricted. Palladio housed the birds as splendidly as he did the owners. Below the dovecots, he put a stable on one side and wine storage on the other. The Mazer Villa was designed for Mark Antonio Barbaro, the Venetian senator, and his brother Daniele, portrayed here in his robes as a high church official displaying his book on perspective. Daniele also wrote the commentary on the book by Vitruvius for which Palladio had made the illustrations. 
An antique temple was the model for the Santa Block at Mazer. The pediment has pagan gods flanking the coat of arms, emphasizing that the owners were not merely farmers. The upper story room with the big window looked down on the orchard so the brothers could watch the peasants at work. The view is matched indoors by landscapes of romantic Roman ruins seen over the same balustrade. The frescoes were designed by the great Venetian painter Paolo Veronese. Their perspective illusions of architecture and landscape compete with the simple surfaces and may have annoyed Palladio. He neglected to mention them in his description of the villa. From the vaulted hall, you step out onto a terrace to face a grotto fountain fed by a spring in the hillside. Palladio explained, the fountain makes a pool that serves as a fish pond. The water leaving this place runs into the kitchen and from there to irrigate the garden. And then the orchard, which is huge and full of superior fruits. Mark Antonio Barbaro had supported Palladio's proposal to build the Redentorian Venice on a circular plan. It was rejected. Twenty years after the construction of the villa at Mazer, Mark Antonio's son had Palladio build his last church, a circular chapel at the bend of the public road. Its columns, sculptures, and rich garlands are all in stucco. Country buildings were never made in stone. It may be a miniature version of the Redentore project. At Malcontenta, the village of discontent, Palladio designed a different kind of villa on a canal adjacent to the Venetian lagoon. From Venice to this boat landing was only an hour's gondola ride. The Foscari Villa must have been more a weekend retreat than a farm center. The building is a compact block without agricultural workspaces. On the opposite side, facing away from the canal, there's no temple front. The facade has the typical Palladian three-part division, and the stucco is molded into intricate patterns imitating masonry. The large central window, emphasizing the grandeur of the two-story salon, is taken from the Roman baths, and Palladio used it often. The main floor is high off the ground, perhaps because the swampy soil would not allow a sunken basement. Palladio was always conscious of the character of the site. Villa Amo at Fanzolo is on flat land south of Mazer. It's the same type as the Villa Barbaro and has similar arcaded wings and dovecots. It combines the world of the farmer with that of the country gentleman. But unlike Mazer, it has the simplest windows and arches without frames or molding. The rear facade has no ornament at all. The simplicity calls attention to the proportions. Palladio commented on the practicality of the design. Cellars, granaries, and stables and other places for farming are on either side of the owner's house, and one can get to them under cover. This is one of the principal things one seeks in a farmhouse. Arcades like this he adapted from traditional local farm buildings called barquese.
One of these, not far from Villa Amo, still houses the farmers, their animals, and the implements, as it did in Palladio's time. The arcades of Villa Amo must have looked much the same. The solid stone platform reaching to the public road probably served as a threshing floor. It also may have been used to dry the maize, a food staple that had originated in America and was introduced into the Veneto in the 16th century. The entrance ramp may be original, though the picture of the villa in the four books shows a stairway leading to the porch. As in all Palladio villas, the plan is strictly symmetrical around a central spine, which results in a three-part division, as on the facade. From the porch, one passes through a vaulted entranceway directly into the salon. Every room is frescoed on all walls with themes more severe than those in other villas. The paintings in the salon tell a story taken from the Roman historian Livy of a father who kills his daughter to protect her from the advances of a tyrant. Other rooms illustrate the deeds of the gods and the seasons and the arts. Leonardo Amo wanted his visitors to know that he was a man of stern character as well as of refined taste. Hilltop just outside Vicenza, Palladio designed the suburban villa that came to be called La Rotonda. The owner, Monsignor Paolo Almerico, had recently retired from papal service. But he was not a moralist like Imo. He didn't want an isolated farm, but a place to give parties. Palladio wrote, The site is among the pleasantest and most comfortable one could find. It's on a little hill that is easy to ascend and is surrounded by other pleasant hills. This gives it the aspect of a very large theater from which there are beautiful views on all sides. Some limited, some longer, and some reaching to the horizon. The scenery of Palladio's theater in the round can be viewed from four identical temple fronts. The geometric form and the recollections of ancient architecture contrast with the pastoral landscape. The rotunda is a perfect complement to nature. It seems to be a hilltop made by hand. Palladio's villas had a particular appeal for American builders. The wealthy landowners of the New World, like Palladio's patrons, wanted a mix of practicality and splendor on a modest scale. Most of Palladio's villas were inaccessible to travelers until recent times. They were known primarily through his book, and through later editions that carried his designs throughout the world. No other architect came across quite so well in books. 
The media of the woodcut and the engraving were perfectly adapted to transmitting the clarity and proportion of his style. This is the rotunda from the elegant 1715 edition of Palladio's four books published in London. It helped to stimulate a passionate revival among British aristocrats, which soon spread to the American colonies. In 1725, the leader of the Palladians, the Earl of Burlington, designed a villa on his estate at Chiswick, outside London. Like the Rotunda, it was a place for relaxation, not a residence. As early as 1748, in Newport, Rhode Island, Peter Harrison, an official of the British Crown, designed a public library for Josiah Redwood. It's copied from British illustrations of Palladio's churches and translated into wood. Palladio's Pisani Villa at Montagnana was the favorite model of American builders. It could be adapted to limited building skills by attaching a wooden porch to a brick cube. Rosalie, in Natchez, Mississippi, is a late example built in the 1820s on America's western frontier. The center of American Palladianism was Virginia, where great tobacco plantations supported a privileged class whose way of life could be sustained only by dependence on slavery. A section of the Virginia map prepared partly by the father of Thomas Jefferson shows the plantations lining the rivers and bays of the Atlantic coast. There were few towns and roads were hardly needed. Supplies were shipped only by water and the plantation houses always overlooked the river landings. This is the view of the Potomac River from the house at Stratford an estate of 40,000 acres. Mount Airy, built in 1758 by John Taylor, is on a hilltop overlooking the Rappahannock River. It's one of the few Virginia houses built entirely of stone. Virginia plantation and its English antecedents were like Palladian farms because the needs were similar. Aristocratic landowners wanted to combine large agricultural enterprises with palatial living accommodations. Taylor probably showed local builders the design in James Gibbs's Book of Architecture published in London in 1728. The designs recall the Villa Badoer at Prata Polesine. Several villas in Palladio's book have curving porticos extending forward from the central block, but these at Villa Badoer are the only surviving ones. The porticos appear also at George Washington's plantation house, Mount Vernon overlooking the Potomac River near Washington, D.C. Stone masonry, which Palladio had imitated in stucco, is here copied in wood. The same Palladian theme was carried well into the 1800s, as shown by the Mississippi Valley Plantation House, Maidwood. Here, however, Palladianism was crossbred with the Greek Revival. Thomas Jefferson was the leading American Palladian. He owned three editions of Palladio's book, and like Palladio, he was an avid student of ancient Roman architecture. He started building Monticello near Charlottesville, Virginia in 1769 and continued for 40 years, altering the design as he proceeded. Monticello, Italian for Little Hill, 
is the precise word Palladio used in describing the site of Villa Rotonda. The setting is similar. Jefferson's first proposal for the entrance facade is much more Palladian than the existing building. The drawing was based on Palladio's illustration of the Cornaro Villa in Piombino d'Ese, just north of Venice. The final one-story building was also influenced by 18th century mansions in Paris, where Jefferson had served as ambassador. The planning was based on Palladio's agricultural villas. Functional outbuildings were attached to an elegant central residence. From his pillared portico, Jefferson, like the owner of Villa Rotonda, could admire the distant views. Jefferson probably helped to design the plantation house at Brimo in 1817. He informed the owner, Palladio is the Bible. You should get it and stick close to it. Brimo's exterior is closer to Monticello than to Palladio, but the plan and interior proportions are purely Palladian. Brimo, like Mazer, was built on the slope of a hill. The ground floor on the entrance front is the same as the upper floor here on the rear. Brimo has temple pavilions in place of the lateral dovecots at Mazer. The farm buildings are separate at the foot of the slope. The barn is as Palladian as a barn can be. Jefferson's greatest achievement as a designer was the University of Virginia at Charlottesville. Jefferson wrote, it should be an academical village I would strongly recommend, instead of one immense building, to have a small one for every professorship. The village was dominated by a round, domed library called the Rotunda. Jefferson's original Rotunda is preserved in a drawing by his granddaughter. Students were housed in single rooms behind the covered walkways. Each professor's pavilion had a classroom below and living quarters above. The pavilions all have different designs. Jefferson said in order to serve as specimens for the architectural lecturer. The Corinthian pavilion was based on Palladio's illustrations of the order. The different sizes of pavilions show how the classical orders dictate proportions as well as decoration. Jefferson and his Virginia contemporaries never saw a Palladio building. Neither did most other Palladians. They depended on book illustrations. These conveyed the grandeur of Palladio's composition and classical style and showed the perfection of his proportions. Palladio's way of combining parts remained appealing in modern times, even after the abandonment of classical forms. Today, travel is easier. More people can experience Palladio at first hand. Buildings that seem cool and abstract in woodcuts 
take on humane warmth as they respond to the varied moods of Venetian atmosphere and light.